Putting words down on an empty page is a heartbreaking enterprise. There is a quiet howling in the woods tonight. I begin there, in the madness, sleeping under the birch bark and the briar rose, barking at silence at the moon. There. Can you hear it? Like a snort from a dreaming drunkard. There is a quiet howling in my kitchen tonight. The grumblings and mumblings and complaints of the dishes. The private lives of teacups played out inside cupboards in the dark. And here I write about it all, trying, placing heavy bets with words. And I'm failing. I'm carving away the marble from my masterpiece, and I'm failing. Every new whack of my hammer across the chisel, and she looks less and less than like she did in my head. In my great, sleepy head. I was glad to pass the summer fishing lazily for her, deep in the sunlit dregs of my head. But she never showed up. She just slumbered down in the murk just as my dishes nap behind their cupboard doors. And here I watch the autumn arrive as I scratch words into this beautiful white page, praying they'll be the right ones. And they never really are. I part with thee, dear page, now splattered with my titterings, doomed to spend eternity chained to these few hundred words. The words I have given you, something about howls in the teacup sea, Maybe they'll loosen in the months ahead. Ferment into some gold and harvest wine that we never the thought did have. I go on my way to a new page. Dipped in snowfall. Rolled in the blankness of sky. And I carve words into it. I hack and I hack at the marble. And I'm only giggling foolishly into all the mysterious quiet. Dear Maggie, Ben O'Rourke woke me up from a troubling dream I was having on a hilltop. Am I doomed to meet all my soulmates on the tops of hills? There we were, cast out somewhere in the rolling pastures of Nova Anglia, and we decided then and there to give in to the beasts in our bones and conquer the world together. It had been six whole years since I'd seen him last, and the story started rolling in like thunder while we raced wildly out of the howling hills of Nova Anglia toward the Pacific, driving all night, not stopping till we smelled salt in the air. At eight in the morning, we squealed into town and pounded on the door of our old friend Trix, calling her and her dog Astra out to waffles and coffee and cigarettes. Don't ask me, don't ask me how I know. Maggie, those were mad days, bloody, raw, and mythic, soaked in buckets of brine and lightning. This was earth walked by the wandering giants of the 50s, the hatching pools for swarms of ideas dreamed up by the young and beautiful and chaotic. They exist as a single organism, mutating, growing, tripping over itself yet moving ever forward with an awkward, steady grace.
it's wild mushroom season in the Pacific Northwest, and hunters are hawking chanterelles and matatakis and lobsters out on the street to the highest payer. Every couple weeks, the city spits me and Finn out into the old growth, where we do marathon hunts for chanterelles while the getting is good. Out here, you can always feel the presence of the merry men, an elite band of mushroom pickers that combs like lightning through the great moss jungles. We're only aware of them from the calling cards they leave behind. A whole forest stripped of all but its littlest chanterelles. And then we know they were there last night. But Finn and I know some secrets too. It's always up at dawn, whether we slept last night or not. And our gunny sacks always full by lunch. Then we've got the rest of the day to while away like true blue bandits in a mountain hideout. There was one day we, well, once there was a perfect day. With a strong staff in my hand, said the child as he stood. Oh, how will you go by sea, said the night on the road. With a good boat under me, said the child as he stood. And he stood, and he stood, and it's well that he The good boat under me said the child as he stood. Oh, I think I hear a bell, said the night on the road. On the Pacific coast, chanterelles are more valuable than gold. We pay for our pancakes and our coffee with handfuls of fresh, dirty mushrooms, and the owners are always glad for our business. This is brand new language, no longer stamped in copper and silver. The bums in the street speak it, trading their homemade love potions for good luck charms. There's power in these Pacific gypsies, and wisdom. I met a man named William Crow, who was born in 1898, and has ever since roamed the Old West searching for the horror of Babylon. She's old and crafty, Crow told me. It's slippery as an eel. I'm the last living cowboy that hasn't yet been corrupted by her charms and fallen into ruin. He knew that a final confrontation was coming, and that one of them would surely die. I gave him my allegiance and a cigarette, and left him staring off into the worlds between the molecules of air. Everything there was to make got made ages ago, and now we're just in a beautiful mess, doomed to stitch together the remnants of recycled and re-recycled culture, looking for some way out. I'm not sure if there is one. Earlier tonight I came to in some little five-cent bar, staring dumbly at the back wall when I realized someone had written a story on it in pencil. I started reading. It was a long, intricate story of a world that figured out a way to beat itself, of man's academy and industry and his brief supremacy, of oceans and ships and cities and jazz and all the places east of Eden. It was about the ending of something brief and wonderful and sad. Eventually I got to a part that mentioned me and Tom Cotton, and Finn, and Trix, and all the rest. But I was drunk and teary-eyed and couldn't bear to read anymore. And still, it taught me that the story is already written, Maggie. It's strange beginning, it's beautiful middle, it's tragic end. There it sits, outside of time. Every act perpetually unfolding. And when we die in the story, we're simply reborn somewhere else in it. 
And so my father right now is a boy in the foothills of the Carpathians, lost in the 7th century. And so my mother right now is growing up in an ancient Japanese tea house. And maybe you're growing up in a future I can't even imagine, near the end of the story, playing a part in humanity's last waltz before the crashing conclusion. What was this character I play born to do? I went back to the bar in the morning to finish the story, but someone had scrubbed it off in the night. I'm not content, Maggie. Finn and I are in danger here. Energy grew over the city like blackberry vines all summer long, but now apathy is here too pulling down on the corners of the gray skies. A single raindrop can kill. An empty morning can do worse. Finn's heart is failing without the sun, and as October trudges along into November, he's starting to slip into these long moments of gloom. The danger of the young and creative. A whispering in the night that can only be heard by those who've traded their bread and their homes for wolf's ears. The voice sneers at him from somewhere behind the new moon, jeers anonymously from the crowds in the street. I've got to earn my keep, he told me. I've got to grow roots or I might just shoot myself. I looked into his eyes and saw generations of potato farmers, homesteaders, breadwinners, and I felt sad for him. For I'm homeless now, an orphan marionette with my strings cut off. But how dare I subject my friend to the same fate. I love the earth, but I grow best in air and fire. Sleep in thunder clouds. Dream in heavens. I'm a minstrel of melody and shadow. But these don't fill a man's soul too full. And Finn's got one of the hungriest souls I've ever known. So it's goodbye to the mist and the moss. Finn makes to chase the sunlight. I make to chase after a thief. So for now we're sticking together. Did we accomplish anything here? My pockets are filled with nothing but stories. Finn's are mostly filled with regret. But I know that someday, when I'm an old man, when I relinquish the present world and retire into the winding corridors of my own memories, I'll eventually stumble back into that perfect day. It sits there, even now, waiting for me. And, well, I guess that's good enough. Jack. Jack.